נועם שריף, שלום. שלום. And welcome to culture buzz. Thank you. נועם, I believe you need no introduction. I don't know. Not in Israel, so. not in Israel, definitely not abroad. You are one of the most fertile, successful composers, conductors. Uh, I even remember you giving us a wonderful education via the Israeli TV one day you when have it to came to popular music. You have to do, you have always to teach. So you are, you are basically a renaissance man. Leonard Bernstein, who was a renaissance man, I, I learned a lot from him. As he was the first one to introduce me and to make me uh, into, into a composer, into a musician. He always told me, uh, the Jewish people, they need a rabbi. So uh, I, I have already, uh, always to teach. So teaching is part and parcel of my very being. And that's, that's yeah, uh, we say in Hebrew, you have to make yourself a rabbi. You have to buy yourself a friend. And during the years, with your wonderful music, you have bought yourself many friends and probably became a rabbi yourself, a musical rabbi for many. Yes, yes, I, I hope so, I do hope so. But I have, I have a lot of uh, students and uh, throughout the, the, the years, many years I am teaching. Teaching, uh, not composition, I never taught composition. I thought always conducting. If you ask me why, I don't know why. <laughs> But you know, in the Jewish tradition, in the Jewish, it's speaking with your hands, it's, it's a, almost a profession. So, I mean, you have Mendelssohn, he was a composer and a conductor. And you have a Gustav Mahler, in his lifetime, he was considered a great conductor, less a composer. Now the conductor is, uh, well, went into oblivion, And what remains is a very great Jewish composer. Leonard Bernstein also was a conductor and composer. And so, so am I. And we have, a, we have the, both of, the best of both worlds. I hope so. It reminds me of the famous uh, question, forgive the comparison. When you are a great football <coughs> player, the question is, will you be a great coach as well? <coughs> so when it comes to your fellow conductors, If one is a composer, it will make him necessarily a better conductor? Oh, no, no, no. You cannot. I mean, you see, in, in a profession, there are two, two parts of it, equal parts of it. So it is 50%, 50%, which means even if you know a lot about music and you are a fantastic musician, you need a 50% of something else, which this is the equal part of the your musicality, which makes you, which brings you into this kind of profession. If you study a law, you are fantastic, you remember everything uh, which you are taught. So, but this is one point. The other side of it is if you are able to present the case in the courtyard. It is, you must have a personality, the right personality for your profession. That's, that's, that's a mandatory. I mean, this is, this is something which uh, I always insist. You must have the right personality for your profession. So some people, you see, I see many conductors who have a, a, lesser, lesser, a, a lesser percentage of musicality. They are not perfect musicians, still they are very good conductors. Mm -hmm. They have this kind of, this kind of thing of, a, say, body language, a very impressive. So they can stay in front of an orchestra without even moving them in their hands, and the orchestra will play beautifully. Mm -hmm. Why? So this is a secret. Yeah, usually you don't know, you don't know why. One of, the secrets, like of One of need, the secrets of life. Yeah, yeah, yes, of course. To sum it up, I mean, I, I would say that you must have the right personality for a certain profession. And you see, in the Jewish tradition, you must be both a prophet and a priest. So in, in Hebrew we say, Navi ve Kohen, a prophet is. A, a prophet is the composer, and the priest is like a judge. You have the law, And the judge always interprets the law. Wonderful. So yes, it's, this, is, this is the kind of thing which, uh, which you, have, you have to do, you see. Which uh, leads me to the next foolish question. I apologize in advance. What do you enjoy more, conducting or composing? <laughs> I don't want to give you a foolish answer. <laughs> this is, no, I, I, but I, I am certain now, at this, at this point of time, 
that they, I enjoy more uh, composing. This is more the law than the interpreting. The endless way to, to perform a certain work, the endless way to destroy a work of art, and the score which you write, I mean, the written score which I do write, is not a, not a composition. I consider it a, a promise of a work. This is, the, this is the law. You write something. And, of course, there are many, many ways of performing the thing or giving it interpretation. There is the fam very famous story about uh, Toscanini uh, who performed the Bolero by, uh, by Ravel. Yes, and uh, Ravel didn't want to take a bow. So Toscanini was extremely angry. He says, why did you go on stage? He says, I did like your, perform your interpretation. But Toscanini said, my interpretation is very exciting. So Ravel answered him, I don't want my works to be interpreted, I want it only to be performed. <laughs> Which is a kind of an answer. So I mean, it, is, it, is nice. it, it sounds nice. And it's the bolero it's, we are it, talking it's, about. Yes, it's a, I, I've witnessed many, many, many conductors uh, performing my works. I never intervene. I sit behind the conductor, I see him performing, interpreting my works, and I say to myself, if everything is in the score, let him do what he wants to do. Because a score is like a mirror. You see the score yourself. Mm -hmm. Not every conductor knows that. Nice. And recently, you had the opportunity to sit in Salzburg and enjoy Zubin Mehta, yes. conducting one of your latest works. Yes. But with Zubin is a very, very long relations. It goes to the 60s when he became, when, when he first came to Israel to conduct the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. Mm -hmm. He knows my style. He, he performed uh, almost all of my compositions. And he knows his way. It always, it's always very impressive. Uh, he has a flair for fresco, for big works. I mean, he knows how to go about it. So, and, uh, so I think he's a very, very fine uh, interpret of my, and performer and interpret of my, of my music. And this was a very special uh, concert this because was, uh, of the venue, because yes. of the nature of your uh, beautiful work? I didn't want to admit it, but this was, I think this was the highest moment of my life. Yet. It takes me Yet. now time, yes, Yet. now in Salzburg. You see, Salzburg, this, this is the place, the place uh, of music making in the highest standard, in the highest sense of the word. I mean, this is the, the place for music performance. Nobody will approach Salzburg unless he is very, very good uh, in his profession as a musician. Well, this is, this is the playground of the best music making ever. And from Salzburg you go into, to other places. I mean, this is, well, so, I mean, it, uh, I didn't realize at the time, I was sitting there listening to a concert, and the audience and everything, and I enjoyed it. And I thought to, at that time that I am not, I am not very moved. I am not very excited. I, I, I keep myself cool, so to say. <laughs> but this is not the case. I see now that this was the greatest moment of my life. It was a very moving experience, because of the place, it, because of the nature of the piece, and because of you being an Israeli, a Jew. Yes, it's not only it's not only me. I heard this composition played many times. It was always successful, so to say, with, with audience. Why? I don't know. They know. But the thing is, is this. This was a certain kind of responsibility. You go to Salzburg, not because they are used to listen to uh, Israeli Jewish music. And this kind of connecting both worlds, you know, as an Israeli, I was taught when I was very young that there is the Israeli type, he is the the real, the real, you know, we call it in Israel, I mean, we say, we say macho, I mean, he, he, is the, he is a man, I mean, and of course, he is a completely different type than the diaspora Jew, with something different. He I mean, is the it, sabra. This was, yes, this was in my uh, childhood. And then, you know, to get over it and to start to realize that I am in a continuation of a very big tradition which has to do, as, I, as far as I'm concerned, with the coming back to life of the Hebrew language, which is, this is our territory. Our territory is not the land, and not this, the language, the Hebrew language, and then to connect the liturgical music of a Jewish throughout the ages. This was a huge responsibility. Because if you ask yourself, do I know Russian music? You say, yes, of course, I mean, 
I know, I know the sound of Russian music, the sound of German music, the sound of French music, but do the world know the sound of Israeli Jewish music? And this is a great question. In addition, to, in addition to Havana Gila. Yeah, yeah, you come, yes, you come to a place where they, they know, they know the sound of Bruckner, Brahms, Schubert, Beethoven, Mozart, Bach. You know, this is their, so to say, quote-unquote, Israeli music. I mean, they don't need any kind of interpretation. They know. They were, they were born into this kind of music. Imprinted in their DNA. And so if you are going to tell them something about Brahms, Beethoven, we are not about that. We are not going to tell them. But we can introduce them to a different kind of music, written with the same kind of musical notation, etc. But this is other sounds, other things. And I ask myself, uh, how will they understand this kind of music? When we play this kind of music and you have many citations of folk songs, of liturgical music, and then we know it in Israel. When we listen and we say, ah, this is Eufen Pripyatschuk, ah, I know this is Eufen Pripyatschuk, and all of a sudden I am I'm connected to it by way of documentation, documenting music. But when they hear it, they, know, they don't know Eufen Pripyatschuk. So what are you... What are they going to say about this? And I witnessed a very strange thing. I witnessed German, Austrian and other people from other countries coming to this concert, giving, giving a standing ovation and crying while standing. You know, I never saw anything like this with, uh, with people, with, with audience with, uh, that is not Jewish, 100%. So this was, this was something. And the, the, this, this is the message, this is the responsibility. So you feel that you are representing something which is not, not only the state of Israel, it is much more than this. So first I'm not representing only myself. Of course music has to become universal. I mean if you are Israeli and you write Israeli music, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that uh, this is a good music. Music has to pass through the stage of being national and then it becomes universal, which is accessible to everybody who listens to this kind of music. Mm -hmm. And they can, they can understand something which is the uh, substructure of the, of the music, subtext of the music. In addition to the reaction of the audience at this particular concert, you have done something almost amazing. You have managed to uh, make the New York Times musical critic to regain its faith in classical music. This is yes. a wonderful achievement. This, is, this, is, this, is, this was very strange and also it's a, a big surprise to me that it, it appeared on the front page of the New York Times, which means something. Something uh, mainly to American people, you know. They take, they take European music a little bit from a different, a different angle. But I mean, I saw that the music was accepted and it's very difficult to say music, classical music, what we say classical contemporary. music. Contemporary. I I, contemporary music, yes. Has, has, many, has many faces, you know. And this is music in a changing society. The changing society where you, you almost don't recognize the content of music. You recognize, but in a different way. We worship today the container. We say you listen to music at your home. Ah, what, what kind of a thing you have? You have a CD player, do you have MP3, you have iPhone, you have iPod, you have iPad, all kind of things. I mean, you are interested in this in technological uh, techno uh, development, not, not, only in the, not only in the content, which was when I was very young. Uh, no iPhones <laughs> at that time. So you, you see, you, the human being, the human history, uh, has changed a lot, and if this music was accepted now, so I, I really, I am really excited, and I wonder how how did it come, how did it happen at all? It's a miracle. I don't know. Well, we, we are in Israel. We are used to this kind of. I mean, this is our reality. Miracles yeah. every day, every second. Of course, it's much more than a miracle. It uh, it requires you know, I, I great think work I, and I think great so, talent. Yeah, the Israel, the Israel. If the Israeli, if the Israeli authorities, we always say authorities, government, state. If they would have recognized uh, the fact that the greatest uh, export of of Israel is music. 
is music. I mean, take the, take the greatest orchestra of the world, the best orchestra of the world. Take the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. Who leads this orchestra? Young Israeli guy. Daniel is the Bonner. Call, not Daniel Barnaboy. This is Guy Braunstein, ah, who is the, who is the, concert the concertmeister. Master. And Daniel Barnaboy sits there in Berlin, one of the greatest musicians ever. Right. Yes, so you have, you have the Jewish people, you have Perlman and the Zuckerman and the Mies. I mean, this is our great, greatest e export. I mean, so l just look what happens in Venezuela. That, that we speak about Gustavo Dudamel is not that he is a kind of a prodigy. He is the outcome, outcome of a great tradition of somebody who insisted to have many, many, many uh, youth orchestras in the country. So you have this kind of a wonder. I mean, Venezuela is known because of its orchestras. And when I was a young boy, when one said, for example, Philadelphia, it's always the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Cleveland Symphony Orchestra, San Francisco, Los Angeles, cities were always went parallel to something which was culture. So if you put, if you put your finger on culture, and you develop culture, and you invest in culture, this will bring dividends. And uh, we tend to forget it sometimes, for, for many, many reasons. We are very complex. Not when it comes to culture. Very, very com complex country we are. The question is always of territory. It's a small country, and everybody needs his territory, whatever it may be. I can't uh, think of a better person to ask the following question. Uh, Israeli music, Israeli contemporary music, uh, its place in the global music making. Yes, but it, it hasn't yet it hasn't yet made its impact. You know, impact. when you when you speak of say South American music, you speak of Brazil. You mentioned one name, Jobim. For many people, this is the Brazilian music. You speak of uh, Piazzolla, who represent part of... Uh, <laughs> you smile, yeah. and, and rightly so. It's what represents us? We are still in a state where we discovered the newly born Israeli, uh, the newly born Hebrew language, so, uh, which was dormant for many years, was used only in the synagogue. Now you come to the Hebrew language and you see what is the main thing what, what, is, what is the main uh, subject of the Hebrew, musically speaking, of the Hebrew language? Uh, this, is, this is singing the language. This is why I, I think I, I put a great importance to those composers who compose songs. Who compose, something is between the popular song and the lead, the German lead, in between. You take the Argov, you take the Mati Kaspi, you take the Shmulik Kraus. You take the Nomi Shemer, and 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 much more. They try to uh, to renew or to find a new way of singing the Hebrew language, which is not easy at all. Or uh, Jewish people are singing the Hebrew language while they are making a bar mitzvah in the synagogue. So nobody forgets the, the Hebrew language. I mean, take Leonard Bernstein. He composed his first symphony, which is called Jeremiah. The second movement is part of his haftarah in the in the synagogue. So this is this. We are trying to to see how flexible is the Hebrew language. How can we sing it? So this is one part of it. So the Israeli song can be popular abroad. You take Ofra Chaza with the Yemenite, Yemenite song Ibn Alu, then you have it. But the classical music, which you are, is not yet recognized as such. It's not yet recognized as such. And that's, that's a very good question which you put. But I think in years to come, it will consolidate, it will crystallize itself into something which the people will know. Ah, now we are hearing uh, Israel, Israeli music. And it's very difficult nowadays. Because the, uh, the so-called avant-garde composers of the 20th century, with avant-garde composers, you never knew, is it French avant-garde, German avant-garde, Italian avant-garde? It was a kind of, a, a kind of a Esperanto. And so even nowadays, it's very difficult for somebody, even for professional musicians, to say, ah, I know, this was written in Germany, it was written in America. So if, if I was sitting in Germany, am I Israeli composer or German composer? 
if a German composer would live in Israel, is an Israeli composer or a German, is it? Simple questions, tricky difficult answers. Tricky. Yeah. tricky. When, it, when it comes to our performers, pianists, violinists, conductors, how are we doing abroad? They are doing very, very well. The Jewish people had, they, they have this kind of a faculty to be very good interpreters because they are very well versed in, in many, many languages. So they can, they can kind of uh, make a reconciliation between what they want to interpret and the work to be interpreted. So a Jewish, a Jewish performer throughout the ages, we had many, many great, great interpreters, not always very great composers. Very good composers. Some, some of them were very good composers, like the, you say, Mendelssohn, Mahler, Kurt Weil, Arnold Schoenberg, uh, Leonard Bernstein. Paul Ben Chaim, who was your Paul teacher? Ben, he was my teacher. But with the Jewish composer, there is something which is very interesting. Very interesting. If you take Schoenberg, everybody says Schoenberg, he revolutionized so the Western music. What did he do? He did something which is, uh, I, I will simplify it, it is communism between the notes. <laughs> it's, you don't have tonality, you should not have tonality, you should have a, this kind of communism. You cannot repeat one note unless you repeat the, all the other. This is, this is typical Jewish. And if you go to another strata of the musical creation, you see that many Jews, just because they wanted to, to, they wanted to express the music of, of a certain strata of, the, of, of a society, they brought always the music of those who were, inferior, so to say, inferior. It was George Gershwin who wrote the, the opera for the black people in America. For Gambes. For Gambes, yes. Because they, he saw their suffering. He says, let me bring the music onto the stage right. and write an opera. Not something which will go only in the street of New Orleans, it will be an opera. You take Kurt Weil. After writing many compositions, he came to Drei Groschen Opera. He said, let me take the music of the cabaret and put it on the serious stage. Together with so, Bertolt Brecht. Yes. And you take Lenny Bernstein, who took the question of the Puerto Ricans. You see, also. So the suffering people, the Jewish had always a kind of a feeling. Solidarity. For, Yes. Solidarity for the week. Absolutely. Solidarity for the week. You put it so right. So that he, he, he expressed this kind of thing. So Jewish, Jewish composers used to do this kind of thing. Noam, here comes the time for what we fondly refer to as the unfair question. So I, I apologize in advance. If I would ask you to describe, characterize your music, how would you do it? the influences, the inspirations. Yes. It's a very difficult, I know, it is a very difficult question. I apologize in advance. Yeah. No, no, no. I can see it from the outside and from the inside both. And you see, there are times in the life of, of a musician, composer, be it painter, author, uh, you have to, you have to, you cannot, you cannot live in a vacuum. You cannot. My duty is to express, to make, to make the musics, so to say, of the Jewish people come to, together and to reconcile between the musics. You see what happened, what happened in Israel was that when I was born, the German immigrants, Jewish, came to Israel and they were interested in German music. Then came the side of Oriental music. So, you have in life those three elements, as I usually say, you have the unifying element, you have the element which separates, and you have something which is, you cannot resolve. I try to make unification between all the musics, which I can put my hand on, of the Jewish people. This is, this is my duty. So I'm here to serve a certain, a certain a cause of the Jewish music and to reconcile between what I see as Jewish music relating to the newly born Hebrew language. 
there are two sides in a musician, the museum type and the gallery type. You go to the museum and you see works of the past. And you go to a gallery, you see a exposition, exhibition of, the, of, of paintings by your very best friend. So this is, this is the combination of the two sides. Maybe I'm more of a museum than a gallery, I don't know. It's not, it's not for me to judge. It's but to have, but to have overcame, overcome the universality of my music, which is now recognized universally. Even by it's, the New York Times. It's a great, it's a great, a great thing for the music of the, of the Jewish people. So I see myself as expressing something which belongs to everybody. A man on a mission. If you, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't go down to your people, you never come up from this. You never, yes, you have to express this kind of thing. Will it be fair to describe your music as fusion? I don't know. I tell you, I tell you one thing uh, which is very important. My sons listened to this concert. They said, Papa, this is... This is very strange. In new music, we find uh, we find the prints of techno and house and reggae. I said, "How come? This is impossible." They says, "Here and here and here and here and here." So sometimes you you don't know what you you give birth to something which grows. Uh, it has a life of its own. I should say so. I mean, you write a composition, and the composition grows and becomes older and has a bar mitzvah okay. and marries and has sons and grandsons. And, and you, you are the creator, but you are like the father of something newly born into the world, which has its own life. You can, you can never navigate this kind of thing. It's independent of yourself. Noam, what can we wish you for the future, Only for good the health. present? Only good health. And when it comes to your music? What can we wish Noam Sharif's music? What can we expect? I don't know that it, it will be part and parcel of what we know as, as culture, because music is indispensable to human life. It, it will be recognized and people will 